good evening and welcome to Decision Point. I'm Ben Swan and I'll be with you for the next half hour as we continue this discussion. We were with uh, Henry Kellen. He is a Holocaust survivor. Henry, thank you for being here. His son thank, you for, thank you for inviting me. For being here. We, thank we, you. If you tuned in last week, then you saw it. we were having this uh, just amazing discussion talking about um, the Holocaust and, and Henry, you were a Holocaust survivor. Um, but we were kind of in the middle of a conversation. I want to pick up there for people who are tuning in for the second part uh, because the point that's being made right now is that the Holocaust was not merely uh, something that happened in Germany, it, it, and it wasn't just something that happened among the Nazis. It, it was it was a hatred that spread throughout Europe. And uh, and Joel, you were saying right now. I mean, it's important that people understand the depth of that hatred, and the fact that it it really it's it's hatred is not discriminatory. I mean, it really encompasses and envelops everyone at some point. <clears throat> hatred, according to Buddhism, hatred is one of the three basic poisons. It's hatred, greed, and ignorance. So hatred is a very big thing. Before we go to discuss, before we, we discuss the, th the hatred related to the Holocaust, mm -hmm. I want to make a general point. I hope it's okay. Absolutely. See, um, we live in a democratic society, in a democratic civilization. I'm talking about the Western civilization. And we, we, we were raised on the idea of tolerance. But we sometimes for, tend to forget the difference between tolerance as a openness and tolerating hatred. Because hatred is so poisonous that it can eat up tolerance in, in a couple of minutes. So the question is, do we have to tolerate hatred? So, um, and our idea of tolerance is so broad that it seems that we are supposed to tolerate hatred too because hatred has opinions. Ha hatred has a, has a world view. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Nazis had a world view where the Jews were it, they were, in, they were in, in the spotlight, in the main spotlight, mm -hmm. but they were they had other other soci other uh, cultures also under the uh, radar. Mm -hmm. So that's a general point. I don't know if you want to touch on that later, well, but sure. I, 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 the hatred and, and tolerance mm -hmm. yeah. they have a great friction, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it, that's something that has to be watched in the modern... Well, and it's yeah, difficult I because in a, in, a, in a culture that embraces freedom and the freedom of speech and ideas, uh, which certainly uh, we live in a culture that does, as you're saying, there is a, there is a worldview, and, and the Nazis' worldview, th their hatred for, for Jews also involved blacks, it also involved homosexuals, it involved the weak, it involved anyone, as we were saying, who had any kind of uh, physical disability, uh, mental disability. I mean, they hated really everyone. It was really what it came down yeah. to. They hated everyone. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I don't know if that's true that they hated yeah. everyone. Don't forget. I mean, don't forget. Th that, that's the absurd thing. I mean, uh, they would, in the, during the day, mm -hmm. they would put human beings inside an oven and burn them just as though you're going to have uh, bread in the morning, right? Right. right. And, but the human beings would just. Go in in one edge, one end of the uh, at the opening of the of the oven, uh -huh. and would come out as ashes. Right. And when they were done with that particular, what they considered to be work, uh -huh. they would go to the families in the evening, and they would love them. Okay, but they would love them, and they would play those, with their children, and they would go on vacations. Right. And, but those, and, and I see what you're saying, but, but while those individuals had individual people they loved, the, the culture of hatred, if all the Jews in the world had been exterminated by the Nazis, if all the blacks in the world had been exterminated by the Nazis, their hatred would not have ceased. They would have just turned it to another target. Eventually, there's always someone to hate. There's always someone to... You, you don't... You don't I, I, I agree. I agree. So, so I, but let me ask you this. Today, in our culture today, in our culture today, do we have the either the remnants of or just the same old feeling starting to come back again? Is, is this the same kind of basic spirit of hatred that you see kind of transferring itself from one culture to another? Is it still here today? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> uh, 
you know, we only got half, I mean, half an hour uh, to tell my story. But like I said before, I'm not going to answer what you asked me. But I want to, I'm sorry, because the purpose of coming here is to give people who saved our life the credit because basically uh, while the Holocaust took place, there were people who had the courage to make a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> we do know that 20,000 Christian people all over Europe did save 200,000 Jews. And it was not easy because while doing this, they were risking their own life because Germans with the local police had an, took enough time to look for places where Jews were hidden. Mm -hmm. And it has to be said that in Eastern Europe, if we were found, the people who were hiding us were executed the very same day with us. In Western Europe, uh, the people who were hiding us were sent to concentration camp. Uh, I'd like to tell you my little story, and then I will tell you about the men who saved my life. Um, fall of 1943, uh, the German army was defeated in Stalingrad, and basically they were retreating. And it has to be said that the German high command did not hide uh, the defeats, because in every paper in Germany, on the front page, was always a little announcement saying that our troops, according to the plan, according to the plan, we have to retreat. So German, German people were getting the message that the picnic is over. Now, uh, like I said, uh, uh, the German authority being in power, or the Nazi German being in power since 1933, 11 years later, they think that they didn't accomplish the mission yet because they wanted to exterminate every Jewish child. The future of, of, of Jews are children. So on March 27, 1944, while in my camp, out of 30,000 inmates from the very first beginning, there only maybe left 9,000. Early in the morning, German police with uh, uh, Ukrainian collaborators were going from room to room and taking away still the children. Um, it just happens to be that um, my country was overrun by the Germans in 1941. Uh, my father and my brother were uh, shot in the very first beginning, but just somehow my mother, my sister and her little son Jerry, uh, who was 80 years old, they were still alive. and. Uh, I was sent, this was Monday morning, I was still being, uh, at that time, 23 years old. I, took, went, I was sent by different assignment. And while uh, the Ukrainian soldier came to the room where my mother and sister and my, my nephew was there, and my sister was trying to, uh, to save her boy. And I probably do know that in Europe, the pillows are four times as big as European pillows. And she did hide Jerry under one of the pillows. I understand that the Lithuanian, the Ukrainian soldier with up and bayonet did hit the left, left pillow, and Jerry was hidden on the on the on the right one. On the right one. Right one. And consequently, Jerry survived. Now. And this was, and, and who was this who was hiding in in the pillowcase? No, no, not the pillow. In the pillow. Well, in the pillow itself. Yep. He, okay. Jerry was hidden under That's the pillow. Nephew. Your nephew. Okay. Yeah, my nephew. Okay. okay. Now the question is... Who came with him to the United States? Okay. Who came with you to the United yes. States? Yes. Okay. What is the next... From nowhere, an angel came, and we got the message if we can escape from the camp, he is really willing to hide us. We knew already more or less that the Russians are getting closer, but there was still about at least, um, I would say, 100 miles away. And at this time, you're in a camp? We were still in the camp, yes. Okay, and this is in Poland? This in is Lithuania. In Lithuania. 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 So you're in a camp in Lithuania, and a message comes to you that says, if you can escape... The camp? 
this man and his wife Maria. Okay, his name was Jesus Urbanas, and uh, <coughs> this is this is Jesus Urbanas. Uh, well, it says Labai the Coil, says the Lithuanian. Thank you. This humble man. Uh, he was willing to hide you if you could escape the camp. Yes, and somehow we managed to escape. And he was hiding us the first six weeks in the lapidated barn, and then to the last six weeks, he was hiding us under the floor in his house. All together with not only us, but there were from before um, eight, eight people, five adults and three children. We were liberated by the Russian army on July the 31st. Okay, now <coughs> I consider uh, Andrew Urbanas as my angel. And uh, uh, he died years and years ago, and uh, <laughs> by just a pure accident, his granddaughter got married to a friend of mine, and she lives now in El Paso. Really? Yes. Oh, that's incredible. Okay. And she is, she is a doctor degree. Now, uh, since we are talking about right as Gentiles, let me tell you briefly that there were, like I told you, 20,000. Uh, I want just to mention a few, and here is uh, <coughs> a photo of Mib Gies. Mib Gies, as you probably do know, uh, he was the one who was hiding Anne Frank and, Frank. and her family, mm -hmm. all together eight people, who unfortunately after being hidden for two and a half years, they were found. Mm -hmm. Mib Gies uh, died about six months ago. and. Uh, this brave woman, by no means, can be forgotten. Uh, <coughs> now, uh, here is another Polish woman. Uh, her name is Irena Sandler. Irena Sandler also died about a year ago. She was 98 years old. This woman, may she rest in peace, saved in Warsaw two and a half Jewish children. No. You, How many? Two and a half thousand. Two and a half thousand. Two and a half thousand Jewish, Jewish children. children, yes. How now, did she save two and a half thousand Jewish children? How do we know? How, how, would, how did she manage to save so many well, children? Well, uh, it's a very interesting story. Uh, she was working with the Red, Polish Red Cross, and consequently, uh, having uh, armband, she was allowed to come to the ghetto. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was caught by Gestapo, and she was in prison. Uh, they broke her arms while investigating her leg, and she was supposed to be shot. However, one of the Germans in prison, he was bribed by the Polish underground. Mm. And at last she was crippled, the let out. And somehow she survived, and this woman is being considered as the Polish hero. Mm. Now, uh, uh, <coughs> talking about some other righteous, uh, Oskar Sindler, a German, Oskar Sindler, he saved 1,000 Jews. Uh, Raoul Wallenberg, a Swedish diplomat who in 1944, <coughs> while Eichmann was liquidated the Jewish community in Budapest, uh, he saved over 100,000 Jews, only in Budapest, because uh, the rest, almost 500, half a million Jews, uh, were all sent to uh, Auschwitz and Old Paris. And this was in Budapest? Yeah, this is in Budapest. Yeah. Now, as you probably do know, that uh, while our press museum was on, on the east, on the west side, I did manage, uh, thanks to the city city uh, authorities, to change the name of the state to Raoul Wallenberg, which is still there. Mm -hmm. uh, it has to be also said that uh, there was an uh, American a fellow by the name Varian Fry, Varian Price. Uh, he is also an American angel. He was a correspondent for El Paso Times, and uh, somehow he managed to be in Marseille, France. Uh, as you probably all do know that southern France was occupied by the Germans, with uh, Marcel Petain uh, running the country, country, and he was managing somehow uh, quite many Jews who were in Marseille uh, to the Pyrenees Mountains mm -hmm. to uh, make them possible to escape from occupied Nazi France to Spain. 
So he's, which we call him the, the angel, the American angel. And before you, you turn away, I, I want to make sure people got it because they might have missed it. You were talking about uh, Wallenberg. Yes. What was his first name? Raul. Raul. Yes, Raul Wallenberg. Wallenberg yeah. and, and that is the site of where the first um, Holocaust Museum in El Paso was on Wallenberg Street in yes, yes. West El Paso. Yes. The street was named after him yes. because of the museum being yes, there. The museum burned down and ever since uh, after not having a museum in seven years, now we moved downtown. Right, and it's now downtown, actually right across the street from Channel 9. Yes. Uh, but the name, Wallenberg Street, is still there. The street the is still there. Is and still he there. saved, you said, 100,000? Uh, he sold 100,000 Jews only in Budapest. In Budapest. Uh, basically, uh, before, before he left Stockholm, he went to the American embassy and says, look, I know what's going on. I need your help. And uh, he got, uh, he came to Budapest with two suitcases. One suitcase was full of dollars and the suitcases were full of liquor. And when he went to Budapest, he was trying to bribe the Hungarian and also all the Germans who were there. Mm -hmm. And his biggest enemy was Eichmann, who was at that time in charge of liquidating uh, the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. And this might be told again and again that this was in 1944, while the Germans knew already they're not, not going to win the war. The, Jew, the Germans knew they were not going to win, and I mean, yet they, they yeah, persisted yeah. and pushed and pushed and pushed. Course, and pushed absolutely, absolutely. And so he went to, he went to uh, Budapest with, you said, a suitcase full of liquor and a suitcase full of yes. dollars. Yes. Uh, the two things that speak yes. more clearly than anything. Yeah. So um, now people know. I mean, when they're driving down that street, it's, it's <laughs> the street named after a hero, after a man who, who fought. Now, you um, referred to these people in the other show, so if people are watching this one for the first time as the righteous among the nations. Yes. People, 20,000 you said, across yes. Europe who who saved, you said 200,000? 200,000 Jews. That's Jews. a formal term. Mm. Formal term. It's a formal term that was initiated by Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem is the main Holocaust museum in Israel. Jerusalem. Um, in Jerusalem. It's a formal term. They have their own um, department. department that takes care Specifically. specifically of that, of, yes. of, of so, so anything that has to do with the righteous of the nation. As we talk about this, I mean, we're talking in, about the Holocaust, and, and it's obviously very important to the both of you uh, that these righteous are remembered for what they did, for the yes. stuff that they did. Mm -hmm. They're above. They're above the Jews. They're above the Christians. They're above. They're the prime. Well, I call them our angels. Because you know? maybe they didn't realize the risk they were taking while hiding us. Mm -hmm. After all, they had families and wives, and still they were hiding us. And most of them were poor. Most of them were poor. Mm -hmm. it happens to be that uh, Andrew Urbanas was a very poor Lithuanian farmer. He did it. He was a poor Lithuanian farmer, and yes. he hid eight of you total? Was it five yes. he, they, yeah. were, they were not saving a religion. Right. They were saving human beings. They were, this is the, the basic, uh, no philosophy, no theology, mm -hmm. just the basic everyday being alive, do the good. Mm -hmm. That's what they did. Well, it's, the, it's the most basic tenet of humanity to, to risk one's life for another and to preserve someone else's so life. This is why they are above. That's why they're. The righteous among oh, the exactly. nations. The righteous among the nations, uh, y y Henry, you felt it was important to pay tribute to these people. Absolutely. Um, All means. Why, why is it so important that as we remember, we remember those acts of, of goodness, kindness, mercy, compassion? Well, uh, am I allowed for, for one word here? Um, sure. The courage. And you know, there's the courage of the soldier, there's the courage of the mother, but this kind of courage is absolutely outstanding because the courage of the mother has an instinct that's kind of built in. The courage of the soldier, he, he's trained and he has the love of the country, but the love of humanity is above all. And you have to have a lot of courage to love all of humanity. That's a big, big task. Because, <laughs> you know, when a, a mother loves her children. A 
a soldier loves his country, but a man or a woman who loves humanity, that's a bo Changes. big, big open heart. Changes everything. <laughs> yeah. it is. Uh, can I say something yes, about please. our museum? Mm -hmm. uh, basically, our museum is a reminder how hate and bigotry destroyed a civilized society. Uh, our museum inspires our visitors to promote human dignity, prevent genocide, and confront hatred and bigotry. Uh, uh, the museum is located downtown, a lot of parking space, and I'm encouraged our members of our community uh, to visit the museum. Uh, we got a lot of very important memorabilia, which I was able to bring in 1989 from Poland. Uh, some memorabilia, which we do have, none of the museums do have. Uh, uh, there's no charge of any kind. And uh, give us a call, visit the museum. You will learn a lot mm -hmm. because you will find out that uh, hatred is very dangerous, uh, especially in our community where we got, uh, uh, if I would say, uh, uh, quite many minorities. We will learn that we have to uh, tolerate each other and live in harmony. Mm -hmm. uh, the museum is located at 715 in North Oregon, a lot of parting and you will be more than welcome. And as you said, Joel, to, t to tolerate each other, love each other, but not tolerate the hatred. Uh, that's for sure. That's for sure. I think, I think, generally speaking, it's time to go beyond tolerance. Uh, tolerance is a, is, a, is a... John Locke, the philosopher John Locke, mm -hmm. he brought the concept of tolerance in the 17th century. And it was good for then, mm -hmm. but quite a few things happened since. D hatred is something that has to be defeated. Proactively. Absolutely. Defeated. That means that to tolerate hatred is to weaken yourself. And, and, we and uh, so tolerance is, is not, sh is not it's not a, it's, it's no longer modern, it, it, it doesn't fit our society anymore. Mm -hmm. We have to go, we have to find a new tool. It's a tool, you know, we have to find a new tool that we can live in harmony on the one hand and defeat hatred on the other hand. Hatred is part of human nature. Mm -hmm. And if you are going to grow a garden, you got to take care of the weeds. So... <laughs> And you got to pull the suckers out. <laughs> you got to, you, you know, if you're going to let them grow, forget your garden. <laughs> That's all. It's, it's, it, in, in that regard, it's very simple. How we do it, in, in, you know, educationally, conceptually, mm -hmm. and so on, That's but the tolerance is, I think it's, it's losing its case. Right. I, if, if, if we don't defeat hatred. Well, and, 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 and from what you're describing, and I would agree with you, that, that tolerance is more of a, a concept of standing still. Uh, as opposed to being proactive and moving forward and defeating, as you said, hatred. Tolerance says, well, I'll, I'll it's more of a passive uh, motion rather than, a, than right. an aggressive right. motion. Right. And we have to be aggressive to put down uh, hatred and to put down um, uh, atrocities. And, and atrocities are committed still today uh, all over the world. All over. And we close our eyes to it and we, we act like it's not happening. Something that Sarah had said when we had interviewed her, uh, she mentioned that at the time the war was going on, she said people around the world denied that it was happening. They just would not accept it was happening. Well, and today she says it's no different. Denial is, is the most powerful uh, instinct in, in human nature. If we, this, is, this is part of being a human being. Mm -hmm. Denial, um, ask yourself, why do we have dreams at night? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> if we if if we if we were creatures that had no inclination for denial, 
we would always have sleep, um, dreamless sleep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so denial. Um, you know, I can, I can, um, I, can, I think I can give it to you in 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 in, in the following way. In the in the uh, in the Israeli military, I'm I'm, sh it's, I'm sure it's the same thing in, in, in the United States. When you, when when the people who g go to um, inform a family that the one of the so one of the sons was killed mm -hmm. in the army, mm -hmm. they have to come and shatter the family completely. Mm -hmm. So they get trained for that. And one of the things that they're told is that when, after they knock on the door and, and they're allowed in, to make sure that there is no, nothing sharp on the table. Mm -hmm. And if they see anything sharp on the table, take it away. Why? Because when they give those, that kind of piece of news, you, your son has died. In many cases, if there's anything sharp, they want to kill that informer. That's part of denial. Mm -hmm. See, the de deny the message. Then, sure. Show I mean, this, 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 what this is a madman. A madman came into my house, right. and you know, get him out. Right. So denial is so fast, mm -hmm. and <laughs> that it is the strongest instinct. And hatred loves denial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Yeah. Henry, I'll give you the last word. We have about 30 seconds left. Okay, well, I, I like to end up with a quotation, which I think quite often. Uh, the only thing necessary for triumph of the evil is for good people to do nothing. And this was written by British philosopher Edmund Borg. And that's exactly what it is. There were too many people, too many people, and good people, but they didn't feel like doing a thing. And this is one of the main reasons why Germany has so many collaborators, and this is the reason why they were so successful from the very first beginning, and, uh, it's, and uh, they still lost the war. But yeah. Good people have to stand up. Absolutely. Have to stand up. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Henry, it's thank been you. a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Joel, thank you thank very you. much. And thank you for being with us this evening. We'll see you back here next week. God bless you.